Thank you for that uh, introduction. I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, I couldn't attend the meeting. I, I uh, got uh, contracted the, the disease, the infection, and I was worried about <coughs> coming over. If you bear with me, I maybe cough a little bit. But again, I'm very excited just from uh, presenting this from uh, <coughs> the, the, from from uh, from far away and. I wanted to show you some data about um, how we're working on um, <coughs> identifying the um, contribution of the tumor vascular niche in uh, in a study um, tumor angiogenesis, tumor metastasis, and the model we have developed to uncover the heterogeneity yeah, on the on the, uh, the corrupted the vascular niche uh, yeah. of the tumors. But uh, as it was mentioned uh, in introduction, there has there been has a major, major... <laughs> um, impetus on, on promoting um, the contribution of the vascular niche in both regenerative medicine <coughs> and tumor biology. And one aspect of it that the vascular niche platform has been realized now that we can expand uh, stem cell like hematopoietic stem cell and also, as I'm gonna show, tumor stem cell. I'm gonna also refer to the first infusion of endothelial cell for multi-organ recovery. And this is in clinical trials at the moment. And most importantly, the system we have developed of mini organs or mini tumors that would, I would call it tumor on vascular net <coughs> that can be used for diagnostic and therapeutics for screening for cancer targeting, personal drug screening, and even enabling CAR T cell targeting of yeah, solid, solid tumors, tumor. which is a low hanging fruit currently. But this is the, the, the issue. When years ago I presented in this uh, symposium, we were not aware that the vascular heterogeneity is so profound. So this is a tableau sapien. Uh, presentation of organ-specific endothelial cell. Each dot here is one endothelium, and as you see here, endothelial cells in a healthy individual, they're all different. And there are 240 different tissue-specific endothelial cells. 240 endothelial cells in respect of structure, uh, angiocrine factor production, metabolism, and but the same token, endothelial cell in each tumors are different. Brain tumors, uh, lung tumor, breast, lymphomas, they all have different tumor endothelial cell. And a common denominator among all of these, there's a leakiness, they're disorganized. And I think tumor invasion is not just endogenous to the tumor. I'm gonna show you that the immune invasion to CAR T cell checkpoint is mediated on tumor specific endothelium. And the metastatic potential is also dependent on the tumor specific of endothelium and apparent angiocon function. So I think um, some part of the tumor drug resistant, immune shielding from CAR T cell, and enhanced metastasis may might be mediated by this tumor specific endothelium. So if you want to personalize tumor targeting, we have to understand in each tumor how endothelial cells become corrupted, identify their signature, and then drug them. But just to put me on perspective, this concept of angiocrine factors, we have come to realize that endothelial cells are not just passive conduit for um, delivering oxygen and nutrients, either to healthy organ or tumor. They produce this angiocon factor that are produced in an organ-specific manner. For example, in liver, sinusoidal endothelials produce wind, hepatocyte growth factor. In the lung, they produce MMP14, EGF. In the heart, they produce neuroregulin, agrin. In the brain, they produce BDNF, beta-cellulin. Every organ is different. And tumors hijack this organ-specific yes. angiocon function of the endothelial cells to promote tumor growth. 
So if we want to study this, we need to generate a model system to recapitulate tumor endothelial cell. Just as an example, this was just recently published, you know, the sinusoidal uh, endothelial cell in the liver, just in a span of four endothelial cell is completely heterogeneous. And they produce angiocon factor like uh, Wnt2, Wnt9b are responding as described by us and Dr. Nasi that they regulate the hepatocyte growth. So they are central vein, they are portal vein, they are liver sinusoidal. And in this recent paper in Cell of Stem Cell, we define the phenotypic signature of liver sinusoid, portal vein, and central vein. But more importantly, we identified transcription factors that are induced in the liver endothelial developmentally, which is GADA4, and postnatally, which is MAF-C. And we showed that by genetic models, knocking it out a specific on endothelial cell, that hepatocyte produce this factor like BNP9, induces this transcription factor CMAF on liver sinusoidal endothelial cell, and that's how L6 become specialized. By the same token, as I'm going to show you, two, it, 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 each tumor within each organ produce these factors such as BNP9 to customize and corrupt the vascular niche to benefit of their function. And this concept of transcriptional regulation is taking a lot of momentum. So the whole idea is that that is emerging in vascular biology is that during development, the majority of endothelial cells that are produced by this transcription factor ETV2, which is a pioneer factor, followed by ERG and FLY1. We just knocked out this ERG FLY1, it was just published last week in Nature Cardiovascular Research. Uh, the whole vascular niche is, is breakdown. So during development, you get this generic endothelium, then extravascular cues, biomechanical forces, oxygen tension, substance elasticity, microbiome inflammation, or more importantly, interaction of perivascular cells such as hepatocyte turns on this transcription factor such as brain, for example, ZIK3, FOXF2, that generates blood-brain barrier. We reported some time ago that TBX3 makes glomerulus endothelium, and I just show you that MAFC specifies zonated sinusoidal liver endothelium. And I'm going to show you tumors by turning on these aberrant transcription factors on the vascular niche, make them leaky, make them aberrant, make them immune dysfunction. And as such, this fibrosis, desmoplasia, most of these are generated through this mechanism. It is, is an aberrant transcriptional regulation. Just to give you an example, tumor vascular zygenity is being realized. For example, if you look at lung cancer, lung cancer has this beautiful continuous capillary endothelium but squamous carcinoma and adenocarcinomas is completely disrupted genes, you know, TNF, as uh, Joanne Masage has shown, as David Leiden has shown, um, liver, liver cancer, as I've shown you, those sinusoidal endothelium completely become corrupted and disrupted, and they don't mimic any functions, but they produce the angiocon factors that liver sinusoidal endothelial cells produce fuming the growth of hepatoblastoma, same as breast cancer, same as lymphomas. So the question is, how do tumor endothelium acquire this aberrant function? I'm going to show you, in part, this is mediated by induction of transcription factors, such as ID1, as years ago we reported with Robert Benezra and, and, and David Leiden, <laughs> or recently ETS1 and ETS2. These transcription factors are developmentally expressed on endothelial cell and then shut off. 
But during oncogenesis, it get turned on and confer erdunthilus a bit malignant, uh, bit poor, uh, poor function. Also, another question is that how do solid tumors evade CAR T cells? You can argue, oh, the antigens are not expressed. EPCAM is not expressed in colon cancer. That's why CAR T cell doesn't target. That's why checkpoint doesn't work. I'm going to show you right now that some of the function is uh, mediated in part by the fact that the tumor cells sub subvert the function of the vascular niche and prevent immune attack on, 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 on the tumors. But how we studied this the last few years is, is to be able to get a human adaptable endothelium whereby this endothelial cell are not as stringent an adult endothelium. And this endothelial cell behave like a primitive endothelium and can be instructed to become healthy or become aberrant, such as tumor endothelium. I'm going to show you how we did this. So we took advantage of this transcription factor called ETV2, which is an S factor. ETV2 during development is, a <coughs> <coughs> sorry, during development is a pioneer transcription factor that turns on all the oh, vascular yeah. function. So it turns on all the vasculogenic function. During mid station in human and mouse, it turned off, disappears. And then other transcription factors, such as fly one erg, are delegated to maintain vascular function. So Brisa, who is now, in, uh, who is now uh, doing a postdoc in UCSF, said, what happens if we reintroduce transiently ETV2 in adult human endothelium? <coughs> Can we reprogram adult endothelium in adaptable and tumorigenic endothelial cell? In fact, that was the case. This was published two years ago. We call this endothelial cell reset vascular endothelial cell. Reset vascular endothelial cell. Basically, they become generic endothelium. Now they respond to the microvascular cues, whether they're healthy cues or aberrant cues. This RVEX now has from the model system for us to study how tumor cells uh, uh, corrupt the vascular niche. I'll show you some example. If you put RVEX with any matrix, laminin, intact, and collagen, we do not use matrigel. We do not use serum. Matrigel is poisonous. You should not use it. You should not use serum. Serum is clotted blood. It has TJ beta. Every time you use matrigel or serum, you basically make your cells addicted to TJ beta. There was a recent organoid conference just a few weeks ago that's how I contracted this <laughs> cough. <coughs> it was general consensus that we should, we should try not to grow tumor organoids or healthy organoids in matrigel because it, it is not a physiological matrigel. It caused a lot of issue. So Brisa took at least two years to define this matrix, laminin and tactin collagen or fibrin, or we collaborating with... <coughs> Uh, Andres Garcia be using polyethylene glycol, be put RVEX with any type of tumor uh, organoid, healthy organoid or tumor organoid in three-dimensional vascular niche without any scaffolds. This RVEX self-assembled into this uh, vascular niche, and it, 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 we can show you here, they reach out together, they form uh, tip stock, and they form this beautiful uh, vascularized tissue. This is over one hour, as you see here, they form in this three dimension. Um, I'm going to show you more movies. They have a lumen. They have proper polarity. Not only, not most importantly, they can be coated by pericytes or fibroblasts. And if you see, we can put this um, in large microfluidic devices. And as you see here, it is RVEX, but not regular human endothelial cell can, can reach out together and self-assemble without any synthetic matrix uh, or synthetic uh, bio, uh, biomaterial, 
uh, and and that I'm going to mention that why this is so important because this enable interaction with the tumor uh, tumors, they form this uh, three dimensional uh, 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 blood vessels that can you know this is the microfluidic device, this is the capillary network, and most importantly the reason these are important is because I can push blood through them. Usually this is my blood. As you see, I'm a little bit pale. The reason because I always give this blood, but just beside the point, this is human blood. Human blood going through these microcapillaries. We put heparin, but they don't clot. And as you see here, blood from one chamber goes to the other chamber. And the most important thing, as you see here, we can form very, very large vascular network with this without any constraints. You can monitor as red blood cells go through neutrophils, monocyte, CAR T cells. You can really observe how blood interacts with this endothelial cell. When we were publishing this paper, the reviewers could not believe that we can in three dimension without any scaffold, we can build this. So we made this movie. I'm going to take you now inside this blood vessel. You are now inside this blood vessel. The most important thing in vascular physiology is branching, sprouting. Tumors branch abnormally, they are leaky. As you travel through this healthy endothelial cell, you see branching up and down, you see tight junctions, you see beautiful uh, network as it forms. This is what the real physiology of vasculature we have reproduced in this large microfluidic device. And as such, not only they are tuberogenic, they are adaptable. They have hierarchy, they go from artery, capillary, venous, we can put 400,000 endothelial cells in these microfluidic uh, uh, devices. We can push blood, uh, you know, in, in many large microfluidic devices. We can give radiation, and you can see they are damaged, blood doesn't go through, or you can infect them with virus, and they get thrombosis. So we can have, we can measure vascular density, branching, angiogenic index, blood perfusion index, we call it <coughs> vascular health index. We can put this RVEX, human RVEX, uh, subcutaneously. As you see here, the anastomose with the mouse circulation for up to 10 months, up to 10 months. This is very important, suggesting they are really represent a functional endothelium. I want to show this because this is very important. Currently, the organ and chip models that are benchmarked by DARPA and NIH, they have synthetic porous membrane and endothelial cell are separated from epithelial cell or tumors by this synthetic porous membrane. There is no direct cellular contact with stem cell or organoid. There is no vascular branching and they fail to adapt. We saw what happened to social distancing. I call this vascular distancing. Why this is important? Because I think in this conference, I'm sure people are going to show notch ligand, uh, neuroregulins, fibronectin, laminin. All these factors produced by endothelial cell are membrane bound. In these organ chip models, there is distancing. In our system, this three dimensional self assembled endothelial cell directly interact with the tumor and organoid. So RVEX have the freedom to directly interact with healthy or tumor organoid. I'll give you an example of the healthy functions. We have shown, for example, <coughs> this RVEX can interact with the patient-derived eyelid here is red in the bottom. There is no synthetic scaffold here. And as you see here, I can put 100 human eyelids with 100,000 and this RVEX, human RVEX, immediately vascularize eyelids in this large microfluidic device, we call them pancreatic on vascular net. And I can push blood again. Blood goes through on these vascularized human eyelids. And the, the key important here is that uh, this can go for days, three weeks, four weeks. We can, I can show you that. And I want to show you here how these eyelets 
vascularized by this green arvex. Insulin is blue. Epcam is red. They are heavily vascularized. In other systems, this is not feasible because there is no close interaction. You can get this microfluidic device. You can push glucose, and what you get at outlet, uh, you get basically insulin. So infusion of glucose at inlet of microfluidic device induces insulin secretion, and this allows for physiological function. You can get this. You can put this Arvex, put hundred to three thousand pancreatic islets, inject them subcutaneously in immunocompromised mice that are rendered diabetic by streptozoin and as you see this 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 um, um, <coughs> rvx immediately anastomose that's the key point immediately anastomose for the whole circulation correct diabetes weight loss and physiological detective we have gotten funding from jdrf juvenile diabetic research foundation to start hopefully clinical trials by rather than transplanting this islet to the liver, which is done routinely, which is very toxic and a lot of side effect, subcutaneously for treatment type one diabetes. We can uh, vascularize heart tissue. It just, uh, just to show you this here, I can vascularize uh, human cardiac tissue in, in three dimension, uh, push blood and transplant. So basically for the healthy organoid, we can basically vascularize intestinal organoid, brain organoid, lung organoid, and this can be eventually used for organ replacement, but I'm gonna show you for our screening, I can have tumor organoid and healthy organoid to study the effect of chemotherapy and toxic agent. But this is the topic of, for, for, for this symposium. Why vascularization produce this healthy physiological endocrine factor? When oncogenesis happen, chronic injury, oncogen, aberrant transcription factor is produced and bad angiocrine factor is produced and we get maladaptive repair. And then that promote chemotherapy resistant, immune invasion. And I have shown this many times that while stem cell has shown by many people in our group, uh, Dr. Pollard, uh, Dr. Massage, David Leiden, uh, who they have shown that the stem cells are parked next to vascular niche. <coughs> Dormant tumors are also parked next to vascular niche. And upon they become aggressive cancer stem cell because the tumor has changed, this maladaptive tumor vascular niche promote tumor growth, tumor metastasis. So we have done the same thing. We took this Arvex, human Arvex with human colon organoid. And these Arvex that are green and EPCAM shown here with the tumor organoid, they aggressively vascularize this tumor organoid even more aggressively than healthy organoid. And they form this amazing vascular network. But please look at this abnormally limoder network of this Arvex. While on normal organoid, the vasculature was beautiful, patterned, non-leaky. These Arvex here are disorganized, mispatterned, leaky, thrombotic. So in a way we have reproduced the physiology the, or, or pathophysiology of vascular niche in this uh, organoid model. In fact, as I told you, uh, tumor endothelial cells produce angiocon factors that promote tumor growth. As you see here, for example, here, the, <coughs> this angiocon factor even promote tumor growth, reproducing what happens. We can use confocal microscopy, focus on each organoid, measure interaction of this green arvex with this red organoid, and we can do spinning confocal, we can do Z-stack, and we can capture up to 40 a single organoid. And we can quantify the interaction of vascular niche or control endothelium and use this for drug, chemotherapy, or chemical screening. We can take this vascularized organoid, inject them sub Q in immunocompromised mice. This is just Arvex showing you a lot after five months. Look at the beautiful 
patterned endothelium sub Q. Then look at this RVIX that was co transplanted with colon tumors. They're completely abnormal vascular niche. But the most important thing is that this RVIX, anastomos to mouse circulation, I have here a humanized tumor tissue after five months. Now you can study your CAR T cell, chemotherapy, uh, antibodies to checkpoint in a humanized model system that mimics tumor abnormal vascular niche. So we have tried to use this model to understand <coughs> why, why CAR T cells fail to target solid tumors. So we can make these large, and that's very important, uh, microfluidic devices where we can accommodate up to 100 tumoroids, 200,000 RVIX, 20,000 pericytes. You can take this cell after you study for ataxic metabolomics. That's very important because current microfluidic devices of other groups, I don't want to mention names or anything. They can either use one organoid, which is very tough to get statistics, or they can just use these long tubes of endothelial cells that are not branch, they are not physiological, and you cannot get good statistics. I can push any immune innate or active immune system. Here is esophageal cancer with RVIX. This is healthy neutrophils against my neutrophils going through, and the tumor is down here. As you see here, these neutrophils um, you know, marginate our endothelial cell and then transmigrate and start to undergo netosis and target the esophageal cancer. Uh, but you can put whole blood and all of this stuff. I'm just showing you this, that we can really look at physiology of innate immune system. As you see here, these neutrophils that are transmigrated here are undergoing netosis targeting the tumor. Most importantly is here. The green, uh, the, 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 the green here is our large microfluidic device. Red is our human colon organoid. Here we have infused at the inlet this white CAR T cell that are designed to target the colon cancer. Usually they don't target colon cancer. We have activated endothelial cell. And as you see here, these white CAR T cell transmigrate from endothelium and target the colon cancer. This is just one organoid, but remember, there, as I'm going to show you, there are two, up to 200 organoids here. If you add anti-lymphoma CD19 CAR T cell to this colon, it doesn't get targeted. The red colon looks good, but if you add the anti-colon CAR T and look for caspase, <laughs> You see, there is massive apoptosis as this green, you can quantify that, of these um, colon uh, tumors. And as you see around here, the vasculature is completely disappears, and that's not good, as I'm going to show you. That's called vascular abnormalization, which can cause hypoxia desmoplasia yeah. and fibrosis yeah. that may later on fuel the fire and make the residual tumor to grow. Uh, I just want to emphasize to you the size of these. Each of red dots here you see here is a large organoid. This is colon contour T cells. And if you look at this, the, the red is live tumor organoid. The yellow is targeted, dead tumors. But you see, sometimes some organoids do not get targeted. And in fact, these are resistant tumors to the <coughs> colon tumor cell. And that's, uh, th that's untargeted tumors are the one that we believe somehow develop resistance in all the microfluidic uh, devices. You can take each of these organoids, do z stack and study their function. Here, the CAR T cells are uh, blue. Apoptosis is red. You can do real time. You see here, while the control T cell did not target the organoid, the, <coughs> the blue uh, on, on the uh, on target is colon organoid. And you see they disrupt. They become targeted. 
uh, to and 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 we can quantify this because we can study up to 400 organoid per each microfluidic device you can get very significant statistical significant and also identify those small population of heterogeneous tumor cells that were not targeted you cannot just put few organ and study this with this model system we can study the whole span of tumor heterogeneity because because <clears throat> and then we can isolate them and see why this tumor didn't get targeted we have been given chemotherapy and i'm going to show you we can do all of those but one way we also study real time the targeting of tumor we have designed this report the live dead reporter where if the tumor is alive they are red when they die they glow green and the dead tumor become yellow here what you see here the, the red is the live tumor, the green is the dead tumor, the CAR T cells are pink. I want to show this again. Uh, so please focus on this blue, uh, I'm sorry, a purple CAR T cell. It killed see, close to 20. Again, I want to show you this again. This single CAR T cell killed close to 10 to 20 colon cancer, they become green. The other CAR T cells stayed behind. As uh, uh, Hans Clever published an elegant paper in Nature Biotech, he calls them serial CAR T cell killers. We don't understand why, and they're M NCAM positive. And our model system has been able to reproduce his result in a physiological model where now we can identify this CAR T cell. Why this is a serial killer? What is unique about this that killed so many the other CAR T cell did not? We believe some of this is because they have the right adhesion molecules that allow transmigration. We have collaborated with groups at New York Stem Cell Foundation and we have looked at her to new ovarian cancer. They massively get vascularized. We were doing this um, to help uh, Susan Solomon as you know, she recently passed away and yesterday was her tribute. Unfortunately, our work, I mean, we were in process of helping her out, but unfortunately, uh, there was, uh, <coughs> uh, passed away, which was, she contributed significantly to, to these studies. As you see, this, they can get readily vascularized. Now we have a CAR T cell that target her to new. And I want to mention, not all ovarian her to no positive. Here, the, these um, ovarian cancers are red, CAR T cells are blue. You see that CAR T cell just transmigrated from our Arvex and it started to target these tumors. Like a Ukrainian soldier, you see persistent, it binds here and we have a dye <coughs> that goes inside this cell and becomes yellow through the calcium flux. And you see indeed, this tumor is dying. You know, if you'd ask Carl June and uh, Michelle Sadeline, how does CAR T cell kill tumor in vivo? They don't know. We show here exactly why they kill, and it's fascinating because once this CAR T cell told tumor, you, you get the death here, and then the rest of the tumor dies. We believe perforin is really so. This can also uncover the mechanism CAR T cells work in the system. We have used EPCAM CAR T cell, and what we have seen is really fascinating. Once these CAR T cells start to kill the tumor, because its TNF is released, IL-1 is released, other factors released, endothelial cells start to die. As you know, in the beginning of CAR T cell therapy, many patients died from neurological disorders and pneumonitis in the lungs. This is the answer. We, I think we have started to understand that CAR T cell, upon killing the tumor, abnormalizes and causes regression of organ-specific endothelial <coughs> cells in other organs. It abnormalizes. So our system can allow us to screen for CAR T cells, NK cells, or any type of immune cells, or even checkpoint 
and understand to spare healthy endothelium but target tumor endothelium. And we want to normalize blood vessels so that the targeting is vessel. So we are using a lot of this system for that. Not only that, I can get patients on endothelium, patients or tumor, patients or immune cells. I can so vascularize, can for example, this prostate cancer with everything from the patient. So basically personalize. Here you see a red bladder cancer from patient, patient's own blood, patient's own adipocyte-derived endothelial cell. And we can put these tumors and make organoids from kidney, eyelid, liver, lung. I call this in human on vascular net, fully vascularized, and now I can push chemotherapy. I don't have time to go over this. We have seen that when you give chemotherapy directly on the cells, on the tumor cells, they kill them. Once you put them in our microvascular system, only very few of this chemotherapy kill the tumor because endothelial cells pump chemotherapy out. Exactly how in placenta, you can give chemotherapy to a pregnant mom and placental endothelium with p glycoproin pump chemotherapy out. So a lot of tumor resistance is not cell autonomous. It has to do with tumor endothelial cell where they acquire these pumps and tumor invasion to pump the chemotherapy out and avoid tumor invasion. And we can model all of these in a tumor specific manner. But the most important data I'm going to show you is shown here. I told you that ATV2 has the capacity to allow normalization and also adaptation of the adult endothelium to either healthy organoid or malignant. But what is the definition of adaptability? Uh, Obviously, this was published in that nature paper, but we have expanded this. If you get ARVIC and ARVIC alone for seven days, do single cell analysis, you get signature like that. If you put ARVIC with tumors, like, I'm sorry, just normal healthy colon organoid, you see and you do single cell after seven days of cross education, you see now the profile of these endothelial cells are changing. And in fact, what happens is that those endothelial cells, those RVX that were in close proximity of the colon organoids, normal colon organoids, they acquire intestinal vessel signature. This was just published by Brisa, PLVAP, TF3, FABB2. They are all signature of intestinal vessels. So these RVX partially get educated with the colon organoid. By the same token, if we put this uh, RVX in another experiment, you do single cell, you see they have this signature, we put them with tumors, none of the endothelials look normal. They shift all the way up here. They become maleducated and they produce factors that are representative of tumor vascular niche, including it one, as you know, in year, many years ago, uh, Robert Benezra, David Leiden showed that it one, it two, uh, conferred tumor endothelial cell with their malignancy. In fact, they knocked out it one and it two in tumor endothelium, tumor would not grow. That was front page New York Times. And then I came in and I show if you transplant normal endothelium that has no it one with David, we can throw tumor growth. Right here, it one gets upregulated in this tumor endothelial cell RVX. So basically, ATV2 endothelial cell are not just tumorogenic, they can self-assemble in these beautiful vessels. They can undergo tumor specific, tissue specific. Good adaptation or maladaptation? What's the mechanism? How does ETB2 as a pioneer factor can achieve this function? Please note, OCT4 for IPS, wreak havoc in genome. OCT4 erases genomic... Nobody discusses that. 
every genomic imprint in gene get erased by OCT4. Here, ETV2 does not erase, and ETV2 is a specific for vascular niche. It only turns on the enhancer and promoter region of the endothelial cells. So while in adult endothelial cells, many of the enhancers are turned off to make that tissue specific, ATV2 poisons them. You see here we have done on ETV human and ETV2 chip analysis, and we show that, for example, H3K2 acetylated <coughs> are all poised at the vasculogenic promoters. And then there is this decrease on this suppressor, H3K2 trimethyl. <coughs> and as such, the suppression is released. Now, this poison endothelial cell now reactivate and respond to biomechanical forces, hypoxic environment of the tumor, desmoplastic environment of the tumor, oncogenic factor released by the tumor, and then they become poorly customized as a poorly endothelium, but they satisfy tumor function. In fact, if we consider the students in the audience are, are not scientists, what happens if I want to get these students and make them lawyers? I put ETV2, you go back to high school, you can take new courses. OCT4, take all the way back to the God knows what happened. So also we have benchmarked this vascular adaptation, recently published paper with, uh, with Giorgio and Grammy. This is the last few slides. Basically, with Giorgio, we asked, he was screening a lot of drugs for his uh, lymphomas and tumor cells. And, and he had already shown that out of these 447 drugs, some of them tumor the tumor endothelial cell very well. But as soon as we put this T acute lymphocytic leukemia with endothelial cell, suddenly 50% of this drug did not work anymore. That's the problem. Every group you has this robotics, you just put tumor and you screen. That's not good. You have to have your niche, either fibroblastic niche or vascular niche. And when we tested that, we showed that a lot of these drugs that was ready to put in a trial, when you put the tumor vascular niche, they don't work anymore because it also produce growth factors that protect that. In fact, one factor we discovered was this angiomodulin, and we found that angiomodulin uh, abrogates endothelial rescue of this skin endothelial cell. We found that tumor cell upregulate angiomodulin. That's why they become sensitive. And we showed that when we put angiomodulin back, we can restore the function. Um, in fact, as shown here, in fact, it turns out I had already reported, I had cloned angiomodulin years ago, and it was coincident that we found that we showed that when you knock out angiomodulin here in a mix lymphomas, it kills the tumor. But if you put angiomodulin back, because it binds to IGF as a decoy, it prevents tumor growth. Even more importantly, if you now give chemotherapy uh, with a lot of insulin growth factor BP7, you can protect the tumor and prevent vascular niche protection of the tumor. So the model that we have developed is that beta catenin and FGF4, I'm just going to summarize, are turn on in oncogenesis and resistant pressure on this tumor endothelial cell. As an example, this FGF4 is released that bonds to FGFR1 and turns on these bad transcription factors. It1, ETS2, IGF goes up, insulin growth factor can block that. So what I've shown you that aberrant induction of transcription factor, ATS2, ATS1, it one impairs the healthy function of tumor specific vasculature. Specific transcription factors are induced on tumor endothelial cell. I believe, for example, EGF, um, HGF, aberrantly from, from the tumor cells, turns on this transcription factor in an aberrant manner in the tumor endothelial cell. And I, we believe that normalization of tumor endothelium can prevent immune invasion, increase chemosensitivity, and decrease metastasis. So the similar healthy endothelial cell, 
we have developed a concept for tumor specific adult endothelium for tumor specific endothelium. So tumor extravascular cues, abnormal biomechanical forces, hypoxia, rigid fibrotic matrix, microbiome, inflammation, corrupt interaction with tumor cell, listening to Fox News, all of those can turn on these the abnormal ETS factors to make this tumor endothelium corrupted. I showed you lymphomas are ETS1, ETS2, colon cancer endothelium, ED1, ED2B. We have evidence for ED1 and making breast cancer. And I think we can develop a encyclopedic now of tumor and this allows us to drug this organ. Prostate cancer, we believe is ERG and FLY1. Just in the last note, I wanna mention that eventually if you wanna use vascular therapeutics to clinic, Angiocrom Bioscience, which by disclosure is the company I founded, has done some of this work. Recently, during the last five years, they wanted to show whether transplantation of endothelial cell can be effective for, for, for targeting tumors. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, for targeting damaged tissue. The whole idea was that if you transplant healthy endothelium, can they travel sit on the chemotherapy radiation damage endothelium and produce the right angiocline factor to mitigate injury. In fact, uh, the last six years in a multi-center upper label, dose escalation, they have tried 41 lymphoma patient. This is allogenic hubex that we enabled for GMP facility. This patient on immunocompromised for seven days because of the CD34 transplant. And when they infuse endothelial cell at the dose of 5 million per kilogram, they showed there was no adverse effect in endothelial cell infusion. That was the first endothelial infusion in any human being. I was really scared that you're going to get antiphospholipid syndrome, but it was very, very safe. But the most amazing thing was there was 90% decrease in gastrointestinal toxicity, 70% decrease in febrile neutroponic fever, and the trend towards. Based on this data, FDA has given up a phase three uh, multi-center placebo control on lymphoma patients who get high-dose chemotherapy, radiation, and transplant to see whether this signal is shared. The reason I'm showing you here is because it shows that eventually if we want to use endothelial, healthy endothelial cell with the right cargo to target tumor vascular niche, reverse aberrant desmoplasia could be feasible and could be safe. So the vascular method for tumor targeting is beyond angiogenesis. I show you tumor specific vascular niche render executive function in regeneration. I showed you this adaptable, perfusible human endothelium can uncover inter and intra tumor vascular heterogeneity. I showed you this can be used for screening for CAR T cell and blocking metastasis. I think you don't need to buy tumor endothelium from these other companies. Those are not tumor endothelium. In future, we're going to put trans in adult endothelium, make organ specific endothelium. Or you can put tumor specific transcription factor, make lymphoma endothelium, brain tumor endothelium, breast cancer endothelium, study immune invasion, vascularizing pallet mini organs and personal tumor organoids. So we are very excited. Sorry, I went overboard. This I already uh, mentioned everybody, Jesus Yang, Musia, David Leiden, and many other groups. Thanks for your attention.